Hi there, my name is Tanya and I'm an entomologist from the Academy of Natural Sciences. And today I'm gonna to talk about moth night. So what is a moth night? National Moth Week is um, a, a global event, but originally was started in 2012 by uh, Friends of the East Brunswick Environmental Commission in New Jersey. And their idea was to maybe just get, you know, a review of the state like a statewide, a statewide night where everyone goes and catalogs the number of moths that they have. But it quickly became an international citizen science project and I've been participating since the year 2015. And every year I have either um, at least one moth night with my friend at Hildesley Farm Preserve or just in my backyard or anywhere I can go if there's a bio blitz. And you can see just how international moth night has become. If you just take a look at this map real quick, and for every single little marker there, that's uh, someone who's registered a citizen science event for Moth Night. These are just a list of some of the countries that are participating this year in 2020. And you can see that um, we have countries all the way from Brazil to Gambia to New Zealand, Canada, Madagascar. Um, a lot of people all over the world really enjoy this event, and we I highly encourage you to check out nationalmothweek.org and sign up and see if you can learn more about it. All right, so let's talk about moth night, how to set up a moth night in your backyard, and what are some of the moths that you might find. Again, I'm an entomologist at the Academy of Natural Sciences, and I work in the watershed ecology section of the Patrick Center for Environmental Research. And all that means is I study insects as bioindicators of water quality, and the insects that I find help tell me whether or not the stream is healthy or sick. Um, I have been a moth night participant or planner since 2015. I've participated in bio blitzes. I've helped plan bio blitzes. I've also helped plan a moth night at Hildesee Farm Preserve uh, since 2016. And I also just set it up in my backyard just to see what I have. Um, so what are the types of things that you need to have your own moth night? Well, where and when you set up matters. One of the first things I would say is to avoid a rainy or a windy night because moths have a harder time flying during those conditions. You want to try and find an area that's not that developed, so meaning a mall parking lot probably isn't a good idea for a moth night. You want to be closer to nature, maybe by a stream, near a park, um, someplace where there's a wide open setting and a long line of sight. So if you set up your sheet and your moth night underneath a tree, that tree could obscure the lights that you're going to put up and the moths and insects won't be able to see them. So try and find an area where there's a long line of sight, a big open area near nature. That would be one of my first things. The best time to start your uh, moth night is close to sunset. Um, those animals that you're going to be looking for, those moths, usually come out uh, after the sun sets. And it's going to be a long night. Most of the time we see our best, best moths between uh, 1 and 3 a.m. And so usually we set up a tent as well and we camp out while we're doing it. National Moth Week usually occurs in the last full week of July and it also includes those um, weekends on the other side of it. So it's about a 10 day event. So let's talk about the setup. What are those few basic items that you need to have a really successful moth night? So here's some of the equipment and this is the equipment that I've used for the past few years. One is a stand. You can also just use a length of rope and tie a length of rope between two trees or two poles, whatever you can find. And then you're going to drape a white sheet over that. I use a, a stand that's used for photographers that I found on Amazon.com and it comes with its own white sheet, but you can use an old bed sheet, anything that you have that you're not really using, but it's really light in color because it helps to reflect the lights that you're going to set up. The type of lights that you use is also important. You can use an old black light. Um, and one of the other lights that we commonly use that has a really, really bright bulb, don't look at it, is called a mercury vapor light. And a mercury vapor light you can find on a place called bioquip.com. It's an entomological supply company that's online based in California and it can ship anywhere in the world, I believe. Um, and then electricity. You need a source of electricity to help run these lights. Um, so that sometimes makes it difficult if you want to get out in nature. So some people I know have used generators um, or their car batteries. Um, just drive as, you know, as close as you can. You hook up your car battery and you're good to go. Um, and of course a small generator could also do this for you. Um, so let's see. All right, so this is how I set up my moth night. So let's check it out. Here I am setting up that frame that I bought on Amazon that's specifically made 
for backdrops for photographers. And then one actually came with a sheet. And then I used clamps, which also came with the kit, to secure that sheet to my frame. If you're using a rope, you probably don't need the clamps. Now let's set up the lights. So I use a tripod. You can use any old tripod. This is my grandpa's old tripod. And that bulb, that mercury vapor light, what it screws into, you can actually screw into a tripod to keep it um, stationary. My daughter's helping me out, as you can see. And there's the black light, which I also clip on. This is what the setup looks like, a little bit more closer view to see some of the details that you couldn't see in the video that I had before. Um, I do need to weigh this uh, frame down because if not, some of the lighter, lighter winds will probably blow it over. And then I do secure the sheet to the frame with these clamps um, and they came with the frame itself. And this is what the setup looks like um, when we're all done and ready to go and start our moth night. Um, now, if you go to a place called BioQuip, they also have a pre-made uh, a moth sheet, something that's really easy for you to use. You can also get your mercury vapor bulbs there. Um, this is Stephen Mason. He also works at the Academy of Natural Science as an entomologist. Um, and this is a, one of the bio blitzes that we had done many, many years ago. Um, this is what it looks like when the sun finally sets. The mercury vapor bulb does give off a very strange like greenish blue glow. Um, you need to be very careful. Don't look directly at it as a long-term exposure can hurt your eyesight. Um, and this is my setup in my backyard. This is what it looks like. And this is the setup that uh, with the BioQuip sheet, you can see that there's a luna moth there. Um, that was in the Hopewell uh, Furnace National Park, which was um, also in Pennsylvania. One of the things that you do need is a reference field guide. It helps you identify what you're seeing. And you need one for the moths because there's usually a lot of moths. And I highly recommend the Peterson Field Guide to Moths. And that's for the Northeastern North America and then the Kaufman Field Guide to Insects of North America. Both of these are available online or through the publishing um, places. You can also get them in BioQuip. Um, then there's also online resources. One of the best online resources um, that we have right now is a, an app and a website, and it's called iNaturalist. So you can join it, it's free. Um, it's really easy to use. You upload a, whatever observation you have, like a photograph, and this actually helps you identify it sometimes. They're not always 100% accurate, but it's actually really nice to use when you're just starting out and you need some help with identification. Um, another great website that I love is called bugguide.net. This is basically the precursor to iNaturalist, but it's only for insects. Now, this is a handout that National Moth Week put together in 2015, and it's a guide to the typical resting positions and the characteristics of the most common moth families that you'd see. And this is pretty common no matter where you are in the world. And we have some ones layer like the plume moths. These are really easy to spot. Your silk moths are really big moths, the beautiful ones like luna moths or um, the Eocles moths. And then you have the sphingidae, the hawk moths. These are the ones that uh, are able to fly like hummingbirds. And then you have some of the other uh, groups like the underwings, the caterpillars, tent and forest caterpillar moths, slug moths, clear wing borers, crambids, pyralids, tortricids, um, and these are the really tiny ones, the gelichaeids. Those are some of my favorite ones and the, the understated beautiful moths that are out there. So now we have our lights set up and this is kind of what you're going to see and experience. Um, this is what we had last year at Hill to see. So you can see that Eocles moth here. Here's an underwing moth and some of the other ones. And this is about I would say midnight 1 a.m. So we had a pretty good showing by that point. This is um, what I saw on my sheet just last month. We'll play that. And you can see that um, there's my tent all set up, ready to go. Uh, this was fairly early in the evening, about 10 p.m. So there wasn't as much on that sheet. But this right here on the right-hand side, we set this up at the Upper Delaware Bio Blitz, and we set up right next to a stream. <laughs> It was so intense because those are all caddis flies um, and little midges and moths. And it was really, really intense. They, we just could not get away from them. So let's go over some of the moth night visitors that you might get. I always like to make sure that I bring my friends with me. And one of the friends I had with me this time was my cat, Rex. And you get the little tiny moths like this. Um, 
was surprising to be surrounded with tiger beetles, which I've never seen in my backyard. This is so fun. Lots and lots of little leaf hoppers. All right, so let's check out some videos of what else I saw throughout the night. We're going to play those for you next. I think one other thing that people don't realize is that there are insects flying everywhere. And this lamp is so hot and so bright that you can't look at it directly. But if you look all around where the light is, you'll find a lot of cool stuff. A lot of times we'll find things in the grass. You can see things flying around all over the place. Pretty sure there's something on my glasses. So this cicada is really stressed out. So I've put it on an ice cube to try and get him to just to calm down a little bit so we can take our closer look at him. While he calms down, I'll show you some of the things that have shown up. Here's a moth. And this is another kind of moth right here. And of course, our stink bugs. Oh, that looks like a baby mantis bid trying to find the little tiny things to eat. Look at him go. And this looks like a green lacewing, kind of from the side, but this is actually a green lacewing right there. This is a different kind of stink bug and a different kind of moth. This one's actually quite lovely. We have a geometric moth right there. Let's see. Let's go up. This one's beautiful. Look at those markings on the side there. And here's a larger mantis fin. He's eating something else, I think. Beautiful scarab beetle. A really adorable tree hopper. Let's see. There's a click beetle. And I thought I saw Another geometric moth. We'll come back. Hopefully that enabled you to see a little bit more of what it looks like when you're in a moth night and a little bit more of the dynamics of like how they're moving around and how many are there. Um, so now I'm going to go over some of all the different species that I found here in the state of Pennsylvania. This is mostly on the northeast part of the state of Pennsylvania, up and down the Delaware River. Um, and these are the most common things that I see almost every time I go. So um, one by one, we'll go through them. I'm not going to name every single one. That might get a little boring. But I'll go over some of the more um, beautiful ones that I find really um, nice to look at. Um, another really t useful tool, if you can, is to save those little um, cups when you get takeout. And usually they fill them with like coleslaw or pico de gallo or some type of sauce, clean them out really well. And if they're clear enough and you save the lid, you can put that up on the sheet, grab your moth and put the lid on it. And this allows you to like take a closer look. You can take that container and put it on an ice pack. And when that cools down the insect, it lets them stay still for a little bit longer so you can get a, a better uh, macro uh, shot if you're using a nice camera um, or your phone. So here's some of the moths that I've found over the years. This one up here is the eyed Deictes. This is the Isabella tiger moth. I always love finding this when I go mothing with uh, Issa Betancourt from the Academy, because it's basically named after her, I think. Um, this is the black bordered lemon moth, and this is the Harris's three spot. What do we have here? So here are some crambids right here. This is the tiger moth. 
Um, this is a tiger moth. This is what we call a looper moth. There's a whole bunch of different types of these in various colors and patterns. Um, but the most common thing that they all have is when they hold their wings and their wings are that same shape. And they usually have like a little tuft of fur or hairs that come up there on their thorax. This right here is the um, tulip tree beauty. And this right here is the Alanthus webworm. This is really common. You'll see these at the lights all the time. They're very distinctive. And this isn't a beetle, this is actually a moth. Um, and this one right here, I, a lot of people gravitate toward the larger moths, but I always enjoy the little tiny micro moths like the galakioids. And this is one of those right there, this beautiful orange one here on the corner. Um, this is another one of my favorites here, this one right here. It's called the boxwood leaf tear. And this is a grass veneer, and those are pyralid moths. Um, they're a different type of moth. Um, this here is a geometrid, and these are some more. Uh, this is a noctuid, and this one here, let's move my picture. This is one of the beautiful types of geometric moths that we call emerald moths. And of course, we have our beautiful mega moths. These are the moths that most people get the most excited about when they're out in the field and they're trying to you know, find that elusive thing. You wait up till like two, three o'clock in the morning for the really beautiful moths. Um, so here's that Luna moth. A lot of people see Luna moths, even if they're not doing a moth night, they come to your lights at twice a year, usually in late spring and late summer. Um, and then this one here, this is the Luna moth here. This one here is an Eocles moth. And this is the rosy maple moth. And those are all um, the, uh, the silk moths. They're very large. They usually don't have mouth parts. Um, and they are beautiful, brilliant in color. And then we have the hawk moths. These are the moths that fly like hummingbirds. And there's this one, and this one, and this one, this one, this one, and this one. And this is actually an underwing, so it's a little bit different. Um, and now we have some of the cooler uh, insects that show up at your sheet. Um, I actually really enjoy being able to see different kinds of insects as well as moths because I learn more about everything. So um, some of the most interesting ones that we can find Let's see, our, uh, this is what we call an owl fly. They're related to um, ant lines and such. This is a stink bug. This is a stink bug, two different kinds. And this is what we call a tree hopper. I think in the video you saw uh, that one on the, uh, in the little video there. This is the mantis fly or what we call mantis bid. And they confuse, they get confused a lot with lace wings. So this is what the lace wing looks like. But a mantis bid will have those very similar wings on the back, but and the front, it kind of almost looks like a praying mantis, which is why we call it a mantis fly. This is a crane fly. Um, and this is a really uh, interesting one that I found uh, in the forest over in Perkyomenville. And this is called a stilt-legged fly. And of course, we get katydids a lot of the time because they're out that time of that night and crickets. Um, and I thought it, this was really funny. <laughs> the mantis fly was like, oh, it's so much fun. I'm having a great time. But you know, not everyone does if he's around. All right, so let's check out a, um, a video that the cicada, when I finally got it to cool down, let's see and get a closer look at our cicada. Probably not, he would fly away really quickly. So the only reason why I can touch this one is because I've had it on ice for the past 15 minutes or so. Isn't he pretty? Oh wow, can I get him on you? Yeah. So isn't he the ones going? In the in the daytime, we hear them. Yep. And after this, you can let it go if you want, or we can keep it. It's up to you. He's not going to live very long anyway. Really? Yeah, they're only alive to, you know, make friends and then mate and then they die. Did you meet already? I have no idea. Maybe. Maybe not. He should hit his wing skin. We can. Pretty cool, huh? I don't want him on my, like, up and then my... What should we name him? I don't know. Ricky? Ricky it is. Hope you enjoyed meeting Ricky the cicada. Um, now another group of insects that shows up on your sheets usually, especially if you're near a river or a stream, um, are aquatic insects. Mm -hmm. And these are the type of insects that I study most of the time. And uh, the, the life stage that I study is actually the larva or the nymph, so the babies if you will. Um, and they're usually spending most of their time in the river itself. So these are examples of the adults who um, are usually found near streams but not in the water itself that you can find when you set up a moth mate. 
So this right here is what we call a stonefly. This is the adult stonefly. And there's actually a lot of caddisflies that show up. Um, they look like moths actually, and they're very closely genetically related to moths. They have really long antenna, if you can see them right here. So this is a caddisfly, and this is a caddisfly, and this is a caddisfly, and this is a caddisfly. But this one right here, this is what we call a mayfly, and this is in the genus Hexagenia. It's one of the large may giant mayflies that we see in this area. And this one right here, this is called a Dobson fly. So I have a few videos of these mayflies that I found in my backyard, so let's check those out. Oh my gosh, look, it's a mayfly, and it's huge. And now another group of insects is actually really fun and very common are beetles. There's many, many different types of beetles that you're going to find at any one time. Um, this right here, we see these guys a lot. They're called chafer beetles. Um, here's the tiger beetle that I was talking about. I've never seen a tiger beetle in my backyard before. This is the first time. It was very, very exciting. Um, this is the brown pie, pie, <laughs> prionid beetle. This is a stag beetle. Um, these are some other types of ground beetles here. Um, I think their beetles for me are pretty beautiful creatures and they're so various different kinds that you can find. Um, so let's check out some more videos that I was able to catch of beetles during my um, moth night. Here's a great video of a beetle unfurling its wings. I did this in slow-mo just to make sure we could catch it, all that. Number one, number two. So this video shows you some of the close-ups of some of the beetles I saw. Um, there's some really tiny, teeny, tiny ground beetles. That's actually a, a true bug. Um, that's what we call an oriental beetle. I see those a lot in our gardens if you have one, and that's a click beetle right next to it. Those are also very, very common. Another click beetle. Um, that's a stink bug. And what do we have? Oh yes, and the tiger beetle. is a rove beetle. It's really tiny actually. If I can put my finger next to it, you can see how tiny it actually is. Isn't that cool? Uh, I used to study parasitic wasps and um, Lepidoptera, which are moths and butterflies. So a parasitic wasp or a parasitoid wasp is a type of wasp that will inject its eggs into another insect and those baby wasps will eat that insect from the inside out and they actually kill their host. So that's why they're called a parasitoid. Um, you can see these beautiful long ovipositors here on some of these uh, in in insects. This one is a ichneumonid wasp. These are braconid wasps. But look at those ovipositors. They're really meant to make sure that they don't get their eggs into those hosts. Um, and I do have one short video where you can see the wasp move its antenna back and forth. It's pretty amazing, actually. All right, so a few big surprises that I usually don't expect when I do moth nights sometimes or when I was starting out was um, being able to see all the other amazing things that were going on around the sheet. Um, so if one time we went near a pond and it was a beautiful location and being near a pond means that there's probably dragonflies and damselflies and we were able to actually capture this moment of the dragonfly coming out of enclosing out of its larval uh, its nymphal skin and becoming an adult and it was one of, it was an amazing you know thing to witness we i've never been able to see that before um the other thing that we sometimes see is uh certain insects engaging in mating behavior um, this, these are two crane flies right here, and then in the middle you see a, a toad, and one of the things that you sometimes see uh, are opportunistic predators. So predators will take advantage of a sheet with a whole bunch of insects just flying around. It's like a, a fast food restaurant. You just pull up, grab what you need, and take off. So I've seen toads, I've seen frogs, um, the mantispids especially, uh, I've seen them taking advantage of, of sheets all the time. I also have seen um, stink bugs and other types of true bugs. 
because they have the, the uh, assassin bugs, they have the piercing and sucking mouth parts, they'll just grab somebody up and they'll, you know, suck all the juices out. So I did get some video of a mantis vid actually uh, eating something off my sheet. So let's check that out. Oh, this looks like a green lacewing and a praying mantis combined. And it's actually called a mantis fly. You can see that he's taking advantage of all the other little guys who are showing up at the lights. Oh, and uh, bugs are here. And he's taking advantage and he's having his very first snack. The last thing I'll say is these kinds of events are a lot more fun if you bring your friends and your family. Um, you're able to help people, people help you identify things, they bring a different perspective. You can meet new people, especially if you're going to a public event where a whole bunch of different types of entomologists and uh, naturalists will probably join in. Um, and you'll probably make new friends. And it's great for kids. My kids enjoy these types of um, events every year that we do them. They get to touch bugs, and I can make sure that they're touching the ones that are safe. You can get so close up to nature. It's, it's a way to experience um, nature and what we have around us in a really unique way. And I think that's so valuable right now for our kids. So hopefully you're able to do this on your own one day, and I wish you luck, and I hope you have a great time.